Hello and welcome to the Living Legacy series from Of The I Sing American Heritage Through Song. Now in its second season, this program is made possible in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, which receives support from the State of Indiana and the National Endowment for the Arts. The mission of Of The I Sing is to bring American heritage to life through music, and a cornerstone of this mission is the support and championing of living American composers because they are the living legacy of our nation's musical heritage and culture. This series features a different living American composer and one of his or her settings of an American text in each month's episode, bringing our national treasury of poetry to the forefront as well. I believe deeply in our nation's music and poetry, and it is an honor to be an ambassador of this music with the mission of bringing people together through the power of song. Today, it is my joy to welcome composer Stephen Mark Cohn to our program. Steve has written music for a number of award-winning children's films for ABC, PBS, and the Disney Channel, including the Emmy-nominated ABC Weekend special, Runaway Ralph. He has composed and arranged commercial music for Wheaties, Arby's, Volvo, Hickory Farms, TRW, Stanley Steamer, Matrix, and many others. He created the music for over 50 titles in the Time Warner audiobook series Health Journeys, which has sold over 2 million copies worldwide and which are now distributed in hospitals and clinics across the country. His Hymn for String Orchestra, published by Carl Fisher, has been recorded by the San Jose Chamber Orchestra, and E.C. Shermer publishes his art song catalog, including two dramatic historical song cycles. Mary Chestnut, A Civil War Diary, and The Trial of Susan B. Anthony. His three volumes of American Folk Arrangements under the title American Folk Set were premiered in Carnegie Hall by David Daniels and Martin Katz and have since been performed around the world by hundreds of artists. Andrew Garland and Donna Lowry recorded the entire set on Azica Records. Steve is also a writer for the theater and has created lyrics for the musicals The Quilt Maker's Gift, Unstoppable Me, Little Mozart, and A Beautiful Place, as well as the libretto for the opera Riders of the Purple Sage. Please join me in welcoming composer Stephen Mark Cohn. Steve, welcome. It is such a delight to have you on the program today. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, and it's so nice to meet you face to face. Yes. I feel like we've been friends for a while. It's good to hang. <laughs> you bet. Well, so Steve, I've just had the honor of sharing your tremendous um, accolades, your fascinating musical journey that you're still on today, which is just wonderful. Um, so why don't you go ahead and talk to us about where, where did these things start from? What was the, were there any particular um, early influences, for example, that led you onto this path in the way that it has? So let's condense a life into two paragraphs, which is which, <laughs> which, which is how we our bios are really impressive. You know, when you jam it all together, it's like wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Audrey, I have a theory, and that is that we um, we absorb the cultural influences of our life pretty much between the ages of like three and eighteen. That's when we really sponge it all in the stuff we see as kids, the music we love as teenagers, all of this. I think that forms our sort of expressive center. Yeah. And um, then we go on and years of academy training, either kill it or give you a little bit of technique with which to sort of revisit it. And, and, and it is my belief that, and I have a master's in composition, you know, 70s and 80s, a very strident time in, in music, in American music and in composition where people were writing serial music and avoiding tonality and, and um, so that's when I came of age sort of as a young professional. And it was a real challenge because I do write tonally. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean necessarily 5-1, though I'm not ashamed to use that. Sure. But um, it, I had to kind of butt heads with a very modernist, very judgmental group of peers and teachers. Mm -hmm. And happily, I retained my personal integrity. Yes. But going back, to your, going back to your original thing, um, I mean, I grew up with Mary Poppins. I mean, I look back now and I realize West Side Story, Mary Poppins, The Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, you know, uh, The Monkees. I mean, it was the 60s. These are the things that I loved. Yeah. 
And then you move on and you fill yourself with all this technique and repertoire and everything. And then you reach a point, and I did this in my mid thirties, where it was like, well, what really is my voice? Sure. What, do, what do I love? What rocks my boat? And I realized that I was synthesizing things like progressive rock. Yes, Genesis, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, okay. even Simon and Garfunkel and the Beatles, film music, music theater. All of these things were the things I loved. I didn't love Schoenberg. I admired him, mm -hmm. but I didn't love him. Yep. And so all these things that I loved, I started to synthesize them through my own filter to, to start to develop my own personal voice, which I felt was honest. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. It has to be honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I finally really arrived at that voice in my mid-30s, but it was a very non-linear journey. The subtext of all of this is making friends, knowing people, and being in situations where people don't mind being in the same room with you, and they recognize that you have the ability to do something, and they don't would like to work with you. Mm -hmm. That is how your life has moved. That is how my life has moved. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can actually construct a family tree of influences and causes and effects, and who led to this, and who made this introduction, and how did that bear fruit? Mm -hmm. eight years later. Right. And, um, and it's, it's fascinating. You know, I did my undergraduate, I went from playing rock and roll to writing fugues in the style of Bach. And, and it was, <laughs> oh was I loved it, Audrey, because you studied music at a pretty high level. It's a game, it's a puzzle. Sure. And I love puzzles. And, and it's people are like, Oh, you're a musician. Well, that's so mysterious. No, it's not mysterious yeah. at all. It's, no, it's, it's as concrete <laughs> as you know, constructing a sentence these things make perfect sense yep. so um so for the first time in my life i'm getting straight a's now <laughs> high school sorry it was the 70s i was a slacker a college <laughs> and then you know graduate school and everything that's happened in my life has been offered to me um i i was teaching piano after undergrad and playing cocktail and parties and weddings and just trying to sort of get out there and make a few dollars living back at home with my folks good people no problem there and then i took a gap year then i went to cim the cleveland institute of music as a master's student in composition with donald herb and donald herb was a very um gutsy modernist you know i mean shake him up slap him around you know this oh. kind of thing and and very good at what he did but i didn't his language didn't really appeal to me. So I was the one in the composition department who could write a tune, who could, who could cover any style. And if you need a ragtime piece, I can write that. If you need a pop song, I'll write that. So I was the one who was always dragged in to write music for the theater, or here's a student filmmaker who needs a score. So I was the one that kept throwing these things at. Yeah. So I did all that through my studies. And then I got offered a job teaching at the Institute, teaching pop piano. And then I got offered a job recording for the Cleveland Art Museum. These were just handed to me, Audrey. Just somebody assumed I could do it and didn't mind being in the room with me. So do this. And then I met Jim Brickman. I don't know if you know Jim. He's a very successful sort of pop pianist. And uh, he was a young, he younger than me. And Jim was writing commercials and we met and he had heard what I'd written for one of the theater productions and said, well, you want to work with me? And I'm like, sure. So for 15 years, I wrote and arranged commercials for radio and TV. Uh, and I mean, you know, Wheaties, uh, you know, TRW, Hickory Farms, BP, Arby's, oh you know, so, some really, it wasn't brilliant work, but they were, they paid well. And it was like, yeah. yeah. So, um, and, you know, you get very facile doing commercial work mm -hmm. because you have to write it and sometimes even produce it within a day. Oh, gosh. So, yeah. And so I got really quick. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that commercial phase, I met a filmmaker named John Matthews, who will go down in history as a great stop motion director. Mm -hmm. And he made the mouse and the motorcycle films. Frog and Toad, all these films that were on like, you know, ABC weekend specials and PBS oh. and they're, they're charming. And That's I scored cool. seven or eight of those. He, uh, he let me score. Wow. And um, so those are in the Scholastic Library now, which is really nice. So 
so I had the commercial phase and the film phase was in the middle of that. And I didn't write any concert music. And then I decided I was going to write a musical. I've always wanted to. So I spent three years writing book, music, and lyrics for The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Mm -hmm. I was going to make a musical of this. This was going to be, as I like to joke, when I saw Sweeney Todd, I wanted to write a musical. When I saw Phantom, I thought, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Well, know, uh, yes. I'm not going to I'm not going to slam Lloyd Webber when uh, you know when no, I have three, but... when I have three shows running simultaneously on Broadway, then I could then I can brag. <laughs> um, but so I worked on the time machine, and uh, it never I couldn't solve the book issues. But mm -hmm. my very good friend, and I'm going to circle back to this now. I went to the Aspen Music Festival in '78, uh, still pretty green but really absorbing a lot. Because from the time I learned to read music, within two years, I'd written a piano concerto. And that was very, uh, not a good piece, but still, still takes guts to even try. Sure. Um, so I went to the Aspen Music Festival and there I met Craig Baumler. Craig and I became super buddies. We were both studying composition. And um, over the years, we just hung together, traveled together, but uh, we worked so well together that Craig, um, invited me to write lyrics for a commission for a children's musical for Phoenix Theater on the book, A Quilt Maker's Gift. It's a lovely book with beautiful illustrations about the beauty of giving and, uh, and it's a nice fable. Mm -hmm. Alan J. Pruitt wrote the book, Craig wrote the music, I wrote the lyrics, and this is like 2001 or so. Mm -hmm. and it was very successful. Uh, it, it did very well, it was immediately published, Oh. it's been done in like 20 different states oh. and Craig liked working with me so much that he gave me act three of my professional career he gave he really gave it to me and my act three is art song and lyrics and libretto mm -hmm. and so I'm now able in at this stage of my life to synthesize all these things I love into a broader context mm -hmm. and um, and integrate them and synthesize them in together but Craig invited me to write the libretto for Riders of the Purple Sage, which is a huge three-act grand Western opera. He called me and said, I read this book, we're going to write an opera. And this was maybe 2012. Mm -hmm. I want you to write the libretto. And I always say no. <laughs> and then he says, come on. I say, oh, okay. So um, we worked on it. And Audrey, I've never experienced a collaborative enterprise that was so blessed mm. at every single juncture. Mm. Um, Ed Mel came on to do the sets. I think you may have some images of, of this production. Yes. Ed um, is a very renowned artist of the American West. Mesas, mm. deserts, cacti, you know, I mean, just this expansive skies and clouds. Mm. Ed did the Scenic design for this. Uh, Fenlon Lamb came on as director. She's just a powerhouse, a fabulous uh, marshaller of all those forces. I mean, she held it together. Auditions in New York. And then all these people came on board who I'd never met. Mm -hmm. um, performers. And you realize, you start to realize that our world, art, song, and opera is a very close-knit family. We are all one degree of separation, really mm -hmm. just one from all of our peers. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Karen Wolverton is there, who's doing our lead, and Laura Wildey. Mm -hmm. And they're both just top-notch professionals. Joshua Dennis, Morgan Smith, Chris Ermitter. Um, just these, Chris had done, you know, Cold Sassy Tree, jo uh, um, Morgan Smith had done Moby Dick. I mean, these mm -hmm. people had done major, major work, and they're all here on our piece. Mm -hmm. And so there I have the librettist, Carlisle Floyd, who is a friend of mine through Craig, coached me a little on the libretto he's very he was very helpful he just really coached me on how to get to the point keep it concise don't be too repetitious because as you know some opera librettos can be repetitious just a little bit <laughs> and, yeah. and and i think american audiences and maybe just modern audiences we have to write up to them we can't uh they don't just want a high c and they don't just want a soaring string line they really want a story and they want characters and they want to be caught up in the story. Okay. So Carlisle was very helpful with that. He's a wonderful man. Yeah. Um, but the production went exceedingly well. And all of a sudden I've got this family. Yes. And then the contacts we make, the, the points of contact, all the singers I met through Riders of the Purple Sage, 
I was were Facebook friending me and we became friends and their friends started jumping on board. And around that time in 2019, I decided to do the trial of Susan B. Anthony. But I was looking for, I tend to set essays and stories and history is, is just very exciting stuff. And I latched onto the trial of Susan B. Anthony. I found it online on like, you know, uh, Project Gutenberg, which is right. like public domain stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I and I bought it and looked at it and and it read like a play. It's a play. Yep. The judge speaks. The lawyer speaks. Susan doesn't get to speak. You know, right until after she's the burden. And, and the even bird. then, oh my that? god! Yeah. Even then, do you have anything to say? Shut up! I mean, right? They, oh, they yeah, nothing more letter. from you. Oh. oh, yeah. And you know, and if you read the transcript when Susan finally gets a chance to say, you know, this really sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the judge is like, sit down, shut up, sit down. And then she's talking, sit down. Right. She keeps talking. So I was going to set it like that, where she talks, she's interrupted. She, and I thought, no, no, no. Let's condense her into one, you know, self-contained aria. Then he'll, then he'll slam her down. Mm-hmm. And we will have the pleasure of hearing you perform Susan's aria in a moment. Um, but I did want to say about the genesis of that piece I decided at this point in my life, I'm not going to write anything without a performer in mind and a premiere lined up, even if it's at a university, I mean, anything. So I contacted Adriana Zavala, who I knew through Karen Wolverton and Sage and all this, and Adriana is a whip smart gal and an excellent performer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I called Adriana out of the blue and asked if she would consider premiering this piece about Susan B. Anthony. I wanted to make it for one performer Mm -hmm. who does all the roles judge, both lawyers, witness, and Susan. But we know that popping a different hat on can be clunky and awkward, but not if you set it up properly, since we already know it's a courtroom. We already know who the players are. There's a judge, there are two lawyers, there's a witness, there's the defendant. It's very easy to create musical transitions where the judge moves from the podium to the side, changes their posture, the music transitions, Mm -hmm. now they're a lawyer. Mm-hmm. that's not hard to do within the context of a courtroom right and I'm not a Susan B. Anthony scholar I focused purely on the theatrics of that event sure. I know that Susan is not a, a black and white character I know she has her blemishes as well as as her glowing attributes mm-hmm. she's a complex character and historically um, complex and even right. divisive I'm depending on how deeply you want to go into it this is this is something you know much more than I do about. Uh, but I focused on the courtroom theatrics, mm-hmm. David versus Goliath, these yeah. characters, and, and it's a wonderful dynamic. But here's a here's a happy COVID story. So I finished it. I kept sending movements to Adriana, and I kept saying to her, look, if you don't like it, just no worries. Just say that mm, doesn't quite fit, and you're not obligated. But she never said that. So I finished the piece. She embraced it and then COVID hit, boom. And COVID hit, Audrey, the very week of the final production of the remount of Riders of the Purple Sage in Arizona. They put it on again in 2020, which is unheard of, a world premiere done again three years later. Mm -hmm. And then COVID, boom. And we had another musical we'd written based on uh, Friedel Dicker Brandeis. Maybe we'll talk about that later, Mm -hmm. but that was gaining steam everything got slammed shut Mm -hmm. and Adriana had Susan B. Anthony's trial in her hand. Lo and behold, points of contact, Sean Jeffrey, who works for ADA artist, who I had not yet met, who knows Adriana, who's an ADA artist, Mm -hmm. latched onto that in the middle of COVID and and said, well, why don't we stream this? You know, it's one woman and a piano. We can produce this. It's, it's, uh, COVID safe, you know, these sorts of considerations. Exactly, yes. So Sean Jeffrey, bless her heart, she and Adriana got Myra Huang to play piano for crying out loud. I, know. I mean, you know, my God. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about very top drawer talent here. So Sean directed it and they filmed it uh, at a place called Firehouse Studios in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And then Sean, Sean, reached out and got Minnesota Opera, Colorado, San Diego, Austin, and Berkshire to co-produce it and stream it on all of their respective websites in the middle of COVID. 
And then Larry Brownlee conducted a talk back afterwards since it's a piece of historic significance. Yes. And the Susan B. Anthony people were there, mm -hmm. historians were there, all these experts are there. What? And me. And I'm kind of like, how made in, it happen? This was. Yeah, but I'm just kind of the composer librettist person. Just you know, kind of. You come on. Are, well, let's 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 be real about. It. But this was this was amazing. So the talk back was astonishing. Yeah. The, the piece itself was just so much fun to write yeah. because the characters are so compelling and so clear, and their motivations are clear, and their conflicts are just visceral. Yes. So uh, the, the, this is the defendant's statement uh, from Susan B. Anthony. So mm -hmm. Susan has been stomped down through this entire tri trial, not allowed to speak. She's finally given an opportunity to speak. And in the transcript, as we mentioned earlier, the judge keeps pounding his gavel, telling her to sit down and shut up. And she keeps going and he keeps pounding her down and she keeps going. And I decided, as I mentioned earlier, I was going to have it go. She's the judge. She's Susan, you know, this kind of, oh, wow. Okay. no, that would have been, that would have been kind of a schizophrenic. So I condensed an aria for her and it really is, it's probably, it's probably 85% my lyrics, mm -hmm. um, but it says precisely what she was saying. And I'll, I'll, if you like, I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you. Please, I'd love that. Um, so she says, I have many things to say, but I fear they will fall on unwilling ears. And then the hour begins, where is justice? I heard about it somewhere as a child. It was called America, justice for all. Where is freedom? residing on a shelf in some back room, for I cannot find it here inside this darkened hall. Everything I love, everything I thought I knew about this nation has been buried under words today, twisted and perverted into this bizarre theatrical display. Where is justice? Is freedom there for all or only some? How much patience will it take? How much fighting will it take for us to overcome? My civil rights, trampled in the dirt, laid to waste. I am scolded like a child, told to mind my place, and I must bow before the judges who will reconcile my fate. All are my superiors, each and every one above me. What brutality, what hypocrisy. Where is justice? I heard about it somewhere as a child. It was called America. Where is my America? I know now what I must do, urge all women to the truth that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. And that last line is hers. I mean, it's absolutely hers. Oh, yes. So. And we see that on banners. You know, we see that the, the second generation, the silent sentinels took that And of out. course, of course, you have to put God on a high note too. Oh, absolutely. God. Well, <laughs> it's a great vowel. You know, the, the consonant's not going to... You know, bring the space down. I mean, you just you had the whole thing, Steve. It's it's. So the brain is partitioned, Audrey, and you're always thinking about the rhythm of this, the vowel of this, the note of this, and your and and the construction is so puzzle-like. Um, but so that so that's the text for the defendant's statement for Susan Zaria. And you just toss it up. My goodness, sir, you are a tough act to follow, and you weren't even singing. That was an incredibly powerful. Um, oh, Thank oration you. of yes yeah. oh my gosh um and you know one of the reasons that i love to um have composers do this is even if uh, it, it brings up things that they may not have even realized in terms of the way that they are um connected in a certain way to a certain phrase or how they hear things and then the the listener hears um uh, you know me sing the the piece and, and we hear the way that that was reflected and reinforced musically so it's just fascinating and um for all of you watching i am now i'm so honored to sing this piece from the trial of susan b anthony the dramatic song cycle by stephen mark Cohn. this is the defendant's statement Sure. 
justice. I heard about it somewhere as a child. It was called America. Justice for all. Where is freedom? Residing on a shelf in some back room. For I cannot find it here inside this darkened hall. Everything I love, everything I thought I knew about this nation has been buried under words today, twisted and perverted into this bizarre theatrical display. much that was wonderful i'm well, honored thank you well it was absolutely uh, absolutely my pleasure steve i was so happy that we already had this recording to share and you know th this trial historically did take place in the month of june and this is part of um, what was my inaugural um, of the icing program on on the women's suffrage movement you know the icing does a lot of different programs focused on various facets from within american history but we wanted to align this one with the centennial, which is why it was the first one or intended to be the first one that finally premiered um, last year. And so in that program is a one woman show that takes us through the chronology of the suffrage movement, largely through its leading players, so to speak. And so, you know, historically at this point, we, we've just had, you know, the, the suffrage movement had been paused. 
um, purposefully, um, you know, because of the Civil War, women wanted to, to show their loyalty and their worth um, in the ways that they could contribute to their country as nurses and all of those things. It absolutely was not successful, um, that strategy. You know, we um, the women were very clearly excluded from the um, from the 14th Amendment. And then we had the 15th Amendment, and it, it just caused all of these, these schisms. And, and women really had to go back to the drawing board and figure out, okay, how are we going to strategize? And one of the big historical ways that they decided to do that was called the New Departure, which was this strategy that, that was formed in direct um, response to these two amendments um, in which women knew, okay, you know, uh, we are we know now it's in black and white we're not supposed to go vote um, but we really want to bring these um these injustices to the court we want to challenge them in the courts directly and so the new departure was just the strategy in which women would go and try to vote on purpose and some of them were able to and you know susan <laughs> being the persuasive and incredibly smart gal that she was um convinced the uh the person who becomes the witness in this trial um that she should be able to do that and so she does and then she subsequently um you know is arrested for that and then her trial occurs um in the month of june that following year and so your piece was such a wonderful godsend to me as I was curating this program because it's largely to show the effect of historical music within the suffrage movement, the way that the power of song was such an integral component in swaying people's hearts and minds. I mean, let's face it again, this was just a seismic perspective shift that had to happen for the majority of of the country, the men and the women in our country and music, I mean, what better way to wield those emotions and to, to sway them even before people realize that's what's happening to them um, than through the historical music. But of course, what that meant was that there were these huge pieces within the chronology that I wanted to reflect musically, but of course didn't have, you know, I couldn't find a, a protest song about the trial. Maybe there's one that I just didn't uncover, but I couldn't find it. Um, but certainly, arguably, nothing would have been more um, meaningful and make such an impact to my audience as this this piece that you wrote, which is such just a, I mean, a, just a, a wonderful dramatic vehicle and it just brings things to life in such a, a real way so i was so happy and, and just just delighted when i was able Thank to you. find your composition it just it it threaded beautifully and it, it made such an impression on that live audience um and people have really enjoyed it as well within the the Thank virtual you. so well, yes. i appreciate that thank yes, you Anna. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, it's in first and it's in first person so yeah. um that always helps. If someone's not singing about her. She's expressing herself. So, That's right. uh, but thank you so much for embracing that. I do appreciate that. Oh well, no, it's it's my absolute pleasure. And you know, with your commitment to to the American folk song repertoire, just to you really are doing so many things. I feel that that dovetail with um, with the work that I'm passionate about. So I am sure that this is just the beginning of our um, musical collaboration, which is really really exciting. Um, so bad. with that kind of idea of you know forward thinking and, and exciting uh thinking with excitement about what's what's coming talk to us about some of the exciting things that are coming up for you steve no there's some cool stuff actually um we we have a show uh with michael and linda grady as book writers and craig bomber again as composer myself as lyricist we have a show called the beautiful place it's a musical that takes place in a concentration camp during the Second World War in Theresienstadt. And um, Friedel Dicker Brandeis was a woman artist. And she and her husband were sent to Theresien, you know, put on a train, you know, Jewish star number stitched on their car. I mean, this is it. This is only 80 years ago. This is, this is only 80 years ago. Yeah. And, um, but it's a brilliant story because Friedel brought art supplies to the camp for the children who were there. And her mission was to bring color and hope and light into their lives in this rather gray, dark place. So the piece which takes place in this camp is really ultimately about how art brings color to life and hope to life. Without art, <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing. 
So um, it's it's a very, very powerful piece. You don't see swastikas, you don't see German uniforms. Mm. You hear them. You mm-hmm. hear them off stage. You hear gunshots, you hear megaphones, you know, you hear guard dogs, you hear train whistles. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really takes place within the rooms of this place. And it's very, I would say important. Uh, we actually feel this is art. And this piece even has the kind of emotional scope that it could be done in an opera house. Yeah. You, know, you know, there are some of those musicals that can be done in an opera house because they're either stylistic like night music or they have that grand theatrical scope like Sweeney Todd or something yeah, like this. Absolutely. We think we think a beautiful place could be done in an opera house. It is a musical, there's, there's dialogue, but it's very, very powerful. And um, what happened was after the war, and I mean, maybe 10 years after, they discovered all the drawings from these children. Uh, in like an attic, you know, in a suitcases and things. Mm-hmm. And these are all in the Prague Jewish Museum now, many of them are. And uh, we secured the rights to use some of these in our piece. So there will be projections of the paintings and drawings that these children did of, of flowers and, you know, of, of, of the life they hoped for. Yeah. Good stuff, <laughs> important stuff. Important. So, um, and I could go on and on about all the musical numbers in it and how, how they just dig into the heart of people trying to keep hope alive Mm -hmm. and humanity alive and remember who they are and what they're about in the midst of being under a boot. Yeah. And um, that's an important story. You talk about your involvement in, in American history and women's rights and all how important these are. This is an important story to keep alive. we can not, you know, I, I sound like, you know, the Anti-Defamation League, but <laughs> we cannot forget. No. We can never <laughs> forget okay. That's right. that okay. this actually happened. A modern industrialized nation did this 80 years ago. Right. And um, we cannot forget. And uh, so that's why, that's why we're so jazzed about this piece. Yes. We'll have a workshop in Arizona in early May Good. Uh, a week of performance of uh, rehearsal, two performances in front of an audience, talk back, notes, what worked, what didn't work, what did you think? And right at the very moment it's being performed, I'll be in Nashville at my son's college graduation. Oh, <laughs> I know. See, oh, God. God is a prankster. This is how God works. He looks down <laughs> and says, oh, you're having a performance. Well, I'm going to make your son graduate at exactly the same time. Right. And not just so, any performance. I mean, of such, you know, compounded profundity and, and important and just, oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a little brokenhearted, but it, yeah. you know, y- you you have to go to your son's college graduation. So. You do. He's, he's my boy. He's yeah. my boy. We're very close. So I'll be in Nashville for five days with him and then fly back for the after show assessment. So. Right. But it's exciting. We're, we're quite stoked about it. Well, you should be. And please keep me posted on, you know, where it gets picked up and, and other performances that become scheduled because I, I will do all I can within my, my humble sphere to get the word out because I'm, I cannot imagine anyone watching today's interview that's not like, where can I go see this today? Oh, thank, I mean, well, it's thank just, you for that. Oh, of course. Thank you. And then you and I will meet in the lobby. Yes, absolutely. I I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll get you a ticket. I'll get you a comp. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that now. I think I the lyricist on camera. We got it recorded. <laughs> I'm not sure if the lyricist gets a comp or if they charge him double. I don't know. It's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, whichever. It's on you. because you. <laughs> yeah, you can hold me to that. Hold me to that. I'm good. Well, Steve, I, you know, it's just such a delight to have you. Um, I am, I cannot imagine being an audience member today and not have delighted in, in your stories and been profoundly moved. Um, and for me personally, this has just been been such a joy. I just have so selfishly relished in our our time oh, together man. today, and um, I just can't tell you how much it means to to know you um, as an artist, a colleague, and um, it's it's just it is a wonderful testament to the beauty of what we do and how how grateful we should all be. I today. feel I feel exactly the same. My heart is full. I even have a little tear. Hang on. Uh, I know. Well, yeah, mine kind of got. <laughs> my 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 heart is full, Audrey. Thank you so much for inviting me along. It's the beginning of. As uh, they say at the end of Casablanca, a beautiful friendship. That's so. right. All righty. Well, thank you so very much. And for those of you watching, this has been the Living Legacy Series. We sure hope you've enjoyed it.